trust over grants to community organisations. Let's bring in our poly panel now. We're joined by Liberal MP Dr Katie Allen and also by Labor MP Annika Wells. Good morning to you both. Thanks for coming on. Um, Katie yeah, Allen, uh, uh, I wondered what this means on a federal level, particularly mm. the significance at this time with the National Cabinet meeting regularly and the prominence that Gladys Berejiklian has played in those National Cabinet meetings. What's the fallout from this resignation for National Cabinet? Look, um, I think at the end of the day, a uh, state leader has a team around them and that team is going to replace Gladys and I'm sure she has a strong team of disciplined decision makers that will one of those will now step forward and take her place uh, but Gladys has over and over again had to make incredibly tough decisions through bushfires and through COVID and I'm sure this is a very tough decision to make when her state is facing a crisis but she has made the right decision in order to clear her name she's put a state first by stepping aside so that her um, the ongoing investigation mm. isn't a, distract a distraction to government. Anna Kim Wells you know when um, Gladys Berejiklian uh, resigned in her statement she had blamed ICAC or, uh, for the timing of this investigation but it also brought into uh, the discussion once again the need for a federal uh, anti-corruption commission as well. Where does Labor stand in that discussion? We want one, Fauzia. We want one with teeth. And we note it's been more than 1,000 days now since the Prime Minister Scott Morrison promised Australians that we would have one. Um, I guess the question we're asking this morning is why hasn't he done it? Katie said some very nice things about Premier Berejiklian and just then and how she put her state first and how she's acted and, um, with other people's interests yesterday. It throws into sharp relief the Prime Minister's actions who has spent most of the year telling Australians that his ministers do not need to stand aside because they're facing allegations. His ministers do not need to stand aside when they are under investigation. Mm. Why would he not hold himself to that same standard? Katie Allen, it has renewed calls for a federal ICAC as well, not just to look at the, the coalition side of politics, but to all sides of politics. Absolutely. I believe Australians deserve and need uh, independent ability for um, you know, corruption to be investigated at whatever level of government. And in fact, in the budget last year, $106 million has been put aside for the development of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. And I look forward to that being delivered within so, this term. So when is that likely to happen? I'm looking forward to that being delivered within this term. And it's something I've been calling for and I'm looking forward to it being delivered. Uh, another announcement that was made uh, yesterday, of course, and this was the Prime Minister's announcement that, um, you know, he's bringing forward the reopening of Australia's borders, but really only um, uh, states that have reached the 80% vaccination rate will be able to welcome uh, international uh, uh, travellers. Um, you know, Katie Allen, this is something that you've been pushing for uh, and uh, to, to, to be brought forward much earlier than the December deadline that had been originally been given. But given Victoria's infection numbers are on the rise, given that hospitals in Victoria as well uh, are under pressure, the Delta variant will still be around even with high immunisation rates. How confident are you that Australian state governments and indeed the federal government will be able to handle, you know, more uh, international travellers coming in to the border? Thanks, Fazia. So just to clarify, I have always called uh, for opening borders when it's safe to do so based on the national plan and sticking to that national plan that was agreed to based on Doherty modelling. And I ask that we saw the results of the pilot program in South Australia, which have now been completed mm. for home quarantining protocols and have now been delivered to National Cabinet for discussion. So I'm very encouraged by the fact that this is always a government that's evidence based. It's careful. It understands modelling and it understands how to prepare for the future and how to transition out of what has been an incredible marathon event for the whole of Australia. Now, Australians are looking forward to restrictions being lifted now that they are getting vaccinated, getting double vaccinated in record rates. And your question about are the states ready for this is a very good question. And what I would say is that from the very get-go, the federal government has stood ready and prepared to provide funding when appropriate 
as well, both for hospitals and for those incredible frontline workers who've been working day and night for these last almost two years. The important thing to understand is $6 billion of, of extra COVID funding has gone to hospitals. And importantly, there's a private, po private public hospital agreement which will enable capacity for the surge that is expected as we go forward. And also, Brendan Murphy is getting involved in making sure that he works together to make sure these surge capacities um, are allowed for. We also know that the COVID vaccine has helped reduce the fatality rate um, by over 90% from COVID. Mm. Annika Wells, as we've seen across the entire pandemic, really, each state and territory is sort of running its own race here. We've got different COVID situations in each state and territory, different case numbers, different vaccination rates. Do you think it's a problem that the states are on different pages here? Like you say, uh, Fauzia, the Prime Minister wants everybody to agree with the national plan, which is agreed by the national uh, coalition. But the Prime Minister's announcement yesterday, it was a re-announcement. He promised to get all Australians stranded overseas home by Christmas last year. So what he said yesterday was just a re-announcement of something he promised a year ago. Like Katie said, we actually agree. There is a lot of complexity around what's needed to open up. All premiers wrote to the Federal Health Minister months ago about needing additional funding for our public hospitals once the states open up and there is increased cases. That is not resolved yet. There are national quarantine facilities like the one in Milet Coot in Pinkenbar that are still six months away from opening. National quarantine facilities are an issue not resolved yet. So until these questions are resolved, I think, to be honest, I do a mobile office once a week, more Australians want politicians head down working together around the table than they do having people stand up and announce re-announcements in the garden somewhere. Um, you know, Katie Allen, WA and Queensland are reluctant to stick to this national plan. And Anastasia Palaszczuk, the Queensland Premier, says that uh, you know, they will only open borders only when her health advisers deem it to be safe. Is it fair then for these states to be cautious when it comes to opening up their borders to international states, given the pressure on hospital systems? And yes, you say that, you know, there has been funding that's been earmarked to uh, upgrade these hospital systems and to help them through COVID and uh, beyond as well. But the money's not here yet. The systems haven't been upgraded yet. And yet, Next month, we're supposed to be opening up our borders. Well, let's be clear, from the very get-go last year, there was a dedicated um, agreement between states and the federal government to work to increase the healthcare system. And now that included some very pragmatic and quite transformative aspects uh, to our healthcare system, including standing up um, telehealth, which has been transformative to the healthcare system in helping keep and helping GPs keep people out of hospitals. We also have the vaccination rollout, which at the start of the year, we hope to get to by the end of the year, and it looks like that is what is happening, and that is helping keeping fatality rates down. Uh, we've also seen this ability for the private and public hospitals uh, to work together for surge capacity. Now, as we work through this, we do know that there's now, um, instead of 2,000 intensive care beds as there were last year, 7,500. Um, and there's also a different way that doctors are treating COVID, so they're treating it more effectively, which is helping keep people well. So there's a lot of changes that have been happening, and I'm really welcome the fact that Brenda Murphy is, is working um, as uh, the Health Department Secretary um, right across the system. There is another aspect of this that's complicated, and that is rostering for healthcare workers. We know when contact tracing happens, um, thousands of workers sometimes need to leave a workplace because of one case of COVID has happened recently at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Those protocols are being changed so that instead of someone having to isolate for two weeks, if they're double vaxxed and they've got a negative test, uh, that uh, isolation at home is being reduced quite remarkably, which means that the pressure on the workforce is going to diminish. Now, mm. our workforce, our healthcare workforce has been absolutely incredible. And the federal government is standing by the state governments to make sure that they're ready for what is a transition. It will be a surge transition, but I believe our healthcare system is ready. And I think our healthcare workers are absolutely amazing. Annika Wells, this week the federal government mapped out the path towards ending the financial support for COVID-affected businesses once um, states reach that 80% vaccination target. 
There isn't an endless pot of money and this is public money. Is this the right time to do this? It is for some industries, it isn't for others, which mm. is why we've always argued for a targeted approach, both when JobKeeper came in in design and now as JobKeeper has been taken away, brought back, uh, taken away, brought back, edged out. Industries like tourism or like aviation um, in Queensland, um, we know that opening up, seeing planes in the sky again means that airport workers are back at work after being stood down for 18 months. Um, but we also know that there are other industries um, that have done um, comparatively well in, in COVID. And we also know there's $13 billion in JobKeeper money that has gone to companies that in the end didn't need it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we haven't asked for that money back. We are encouraging companies to give that money back. But when you talk about spend of public money, the horse has really bolted on that one and the Treasurer needs to account for what was waste and what was well targeted. You know, Katie Allen, this roadmap out of COVID does allow for future lockdowns, even with high immunisation rates. So it does mean that businesses will still be affected by lockdowns and will still need financial assistance. Is it fair to taper off these assistance at a time when lockdowns are still imminent? Look, Razia, you can trust the federal government to take care of the economy. And Josh Feinberg, the Treasurer, has worked day and night for the last 18 months mm -hmm. to make sure that the right support programs are available for all Australians um, and for businesses through the disaster that we have been dealing with, which is this global pandemic. But moving out through the transition, the Treasurer is targeting the economic support programs for those industries that need it and supporting those to get out of um, this incredible lockdown situation that we find ourselves in. Now, the agreement with the national plan is as we get to 70% and then 80% that we're going to see lockdowns a thing of the past. And I think businesses will in really appreciate that that's the target we need to get to. They want to get back to work. Businesses want to get off their knees. People want to get back to their jobs. Um, there will be this transition out. Their system is put in place to make sure that those uh, supports are there as we transition out, but they're not permanent supports. They're temporary supports to help get Australia and its economy back off its knees. Right, we're going to shift gears slightly and uh, w put you on the spot because we had, yes, we were talking <laughs> yes. about the bird of the year <laughs> earlier and we haven't given you a heads up on this, but we wondered what your favourite birds were. Annika, we actually, I think we're hearing birds in the background of your shot. Do you have a favourite bird? Oh, Fazio Joe, I'm so chuffed we get to talk about this. Um, my I'm my campaign is for the Far Eastern Curlew. Mm -hmm. um, my girl, the Curlew, emigrates in from Russia and China each year to holiday at Nudgy Beach and Sandgate, which are iconic beach spots in my electric. What a queen. Vote one Eastern Curlew. OK, that's Annika <laughs> Wells's vote there. Katie Allen? Mine's the tawny frogmouth frog mouth owl. Oh. One sits outside my window, beautiful sounds in the middle of the night. Unbelievably wise little <laughs> bird. Um, and number two would be some of those amazing waders. Uh, the Birds Australia are yeah. great supporters of. Their, they're ex incredible. They have little bodies of energy that go up and, and they get up to into Russia and they're quite extraordinary. So there's great birds all across Australia, but okay. the tawny frog moth owl is mine. Very nice. Thank you both and for contributing there. Make sure you get your votes in. I think you've got to vote every day. Annika Wells and Katie Allen, great to have you on. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much.